uh, this evening into debate with the title uh, Nuclear Energy, Our Costs and Risks Outweighed by Necessity. Now, um, nuclear power is uh, something of a hot topic at the moment. Um, at present, the UK relies on nuclear energy to supply about 20% of its electricity. Both most existing reactors will probably be closed by 2023, and none have been built since the 1980s. Uh, a series of accidents, high decommissioning costs, and the problems of disposing of nuclear waste have uh, somewhat tempered the public's initial enthusiasm for nuclear power. However, with uh, rapidly depleting fossil fuel reserves, uh, the consequent rise in oil, oil and gas prices and uh, the pressure to tackle climate change, uh, we find ourselves confronted with the question of whether our future is nuclear or whether we should seek out uh, other sources of energy. Uh, so to my right is Murdo Fraser of the Scottish Conservative Party, who is appearing tonight to propose the nuclear option. Uh, Mr Fraser studied law, one of our rivals, the University of Aberdeen, but I'm not going to hold that against him. Uh, he became involved in politics at a young age and was in fact chairman of the Scottish Young Conservatives from 1989 to 1992, and then the first Scot to be elected chairman of the National Young Conservatives in 1991. In 2001 he became the MSP for the constituency of Mid-Scotland and Fife after the resignation of the previous list member, Nick Johnson, and was subsequently re-elected to that seat in the 2003 and 2007 elections. In November 2005, he became the deputy leader of the Scottish Conservatives when Annabel Goldie became leader, a position he still occupies, as well as being the party's spokesman on education and lifelong learning. His uh, website cites his interests including football, classic cars and hill walking. He's apparently made with Kilimanjaro, so she keeps looking impressed. And so to my left is Patrick Harvey of the Scottish Green Party, who is appearing tonight to oppose the nuclear option. Uh, Mr. Harvey attended the Manchester Metropolitan University, where he was briefly a member of the Labour Party. Between 1997 and 2003, he worked for Face Scotland, and while there, he became involved in the successful campaign to repeal Section 28, an experience he is credited with making him more actively interested in politics, and ultimately leading him to join the Greens. He was first elected MSP for the Glasgow region in 2003, being re-elected in the 2007 election. Uh, following the cooperation agreement, which the Green Party reached with the SNP after the 2000, 2007 elections, he was nominated the convener of the Transport, Infrastructure and Climate Change Committee. In 2004, he won the Want to Watch Award, the Scottish Politician of the Year event, and his website cites his interests as including an effort to enjoy the ever-increasing range of Scottish real ales. Appreciate that. Um, so it'll be the usual format, with, uh, as with pretty much all debates we, we've ever done. We've got 15 minutes from each of our uh, combatants to make their opening statements, and then we'll open it to, um, to questions from the floor. Uh, so by virtue of that uh, great and impartial arbiter of all major disputes, the coin toss, Mr Harvey is going first, so I'll hand you over to his great hand. Thanks very much. Um, I, uh, I am here to oppose the idea that the uh, costs and the risks of nuclear power uh, are outweighed by the necessity. So I thought I would begin in a fairly plodding sort of a way by talking about what are the costs and the risks and what does necessity mean in relation to, to nuclear power and energy issues more widely uh, in, in the current climate. Well, we can look at the financial costs, first of all, and I want to make the case that that's only one kind of cost, and we need to look at a far broader uh, range of different costs that nuclear power has. But let's look, first of all, at the financial costs. So look, let's look at, for example, the taxpayers' money that has been spent on investment in research on nuclear energy uh, over the years. Um, 13 million pounds or thereabouts, uh, billions of pounds on bailing out uh, the operators of, of nuclear energy for fear that they would go bust. Um, and uh, despite, despite um, promises when the, the nuclear energy age was born that nuclear power would lead us, lead us to have electricity that was too cheap to meet up, uh, we see energy prices, uh, unit energy prices, which are far from that. Um, they're not the most expensive form of energy in terms of unit costs, but they're by no means too cheap to meet it. So what we've seen over the years is broken promises on what the costs of nuclear energy would be. 
And I would say that there are broken promises that aren't even figured in that unit price per kilowatt hour. If we think about the taxpayers' money that needs to be spent on decommissioning uh, nuclear power stations, the taxpayers' money that needs to be spent on cleaning up the nuclear waste, and if you thought that, yeah, the, the, the amount of money being spent on uh, research and development for the nuclear industry was significant, we're looking at a, a vastly greater sum uh, in relation to the cleaning up nuclear waste, not just now, but for the future. And that's for the existing nuclear waste uh, that we already have to deal with. If we want to create even more nuclear waste by creating another generation of nuclear power stations, uh, that cost can only go up. So, in reality, we've, we've had a, a series of uh, high promises, great promises of uh, the, the white heat of technology and energy that were too cheap to meet uh, and solving a lot of environmental problems. Uh, and those promises have been broken over the decades. Now we're seeing another series of promises from the nuclear industry and its advocates about what nuclear power could do for us to save us from climate change uh, and carry on getting us cheap and secure energy for the future. And I suspect that we should take those promises with a large pinch of salt. Let's look at some of the other costs, though, that don't just come down to money. Let's look at um, the, the, the issue of waste in general and, and what that costs us as a society. Uh, and I'm, I'm talking globally. That the relationship between generations is one of the fundamental problems that our society and our economy has never really cracked. And that's why we're leading to problems like climate change. It's why we're willing to store up appalling catastrophic problems for future generations to cope with. You know, when I was, when I was growing up, and my, my mum was a, an environmental activist, and, and slogans would come out like, uh, how, how can we justify doing this to our children, causing these problems for future generations? And where we're at now is that we are the future generations, and the generations which are having to step up to the plate and deal with the consequences of climate change, we should be damn angry and we should be blaming the previous generations. It's no longer a question of what are we doing to future generations. We are having to deal with that problem now. The Americans, last time they had a full public consultation on how to design nuclear waste storage facilities, they brought in Egyptologists. Egyptologists to help them design a nuclear waste storage facility. Egyptologists because they knew that those facilities had to last for a longer period of time than any human civilization has yet endured on the surface of the planet. I call that a moral cost. If we're prepared to put that kind of risk onto future generations, I call that a moral cost. There's also an opportunity cost. An opportunity cost in what we've been missing because of an emphasis on nuclear energy as the way to go. Not just in the, 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 the physical spaces, the, the, the land that's taken up, but also the resources that are taken up in terms of producing uh, the, the nuclear power plants, physically constructing them, mining the uranium, um, and uh, the, the, the energy input that's put into that. The investment I've already talked about uh, is, is vast. Compared with the investment that's gone into renewables, uh, it, it absolutely outstrips it. We've spent very little money as taxpayers, you and I, through the government, uh, on research and development to produce, uh, to, to fulfil the potential that the renewables have. So no wonder advocates of the, renew of the nuclear industry can, uh, can say, well, renewables are all very nice, but they're just in their infancy. Well, that's because a great deal of the investment in research has been taken up, gobbled up, and frankly wasted by the nuclear industry. So there's a cost there in terms of what we can't do if we spend money and political momentum on developing uh, a new generation of nuclear power stations. And I would say that there's also an opportunity cost in terms of the research capacity, the skills and the talent of the people who could be putting their skills to use for a truly sustainable future uh, for our energy policy. So that's costs. Risks. Well, there's been much talked about in terms of the health risks of nuclear power stations, and I think if those health risks were non-existent, then we would see nothing like the kind of secrecy from the nuclear industry and from its protectors of government that we see at the moment. Even in the UK, even in the Scottish government, which is an opponent of nuclear power stations, there is a level of secrecy about the health uh, issues.